If you ever talk to a financial independence influencer, one of the most common books they'll mention is this book, Your Money or Your Life by Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez. Since its first publication in 1992, it has stood over the decades as the OG personal finance book for the hardcore fire financial independence retire early followers. So in salute to the authors, Vicky Robin and Joe Dominguez, let me share with you 12 of my personal favorite takeaways from this financial independence classic. And hi, if you're new to the channel, my name is Tay from Financial Tortoise, where we learn to grow our wealth slow and steady. My number one favorite takeaway from your money or your life, redefine the gold medal. The gold medal in the game that we're all in, the money game. Like it or not, we're all in the money game, or we all start out our life in the money game. We all need money to live. Even a monk that lives alone in the mountain at times need cash to fund his or her life of solitude. And everyday people like you and I need money to put roof over our heads, food on the table, and clothes on our back. Thus, if we're all in the money game anyways, it makes sense that we should strive to win it. The issue is how we come to define what winning looks like in the money game. We've come to believe that winning the money game is this. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. It's hard to measure one person's financial progress against another person. No one is going around showing their bank account or their investment account to other people. So it's hard to gauge one person's progress in the money game against someone else. Thus, we default to what we can see in front of our faces. How big is their house? How fancy is their car? How nice are their clothes? When in fact, these are the worst gauge of someone's progress in the money game. Winning isn't having the most toys, it's having precisely what you need and nothing in excess and being able to stop playing the game at all. If you can fund yourself to a point of need and have the option to stop playing the money game, you're truly winning. My number two favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Recognize that time is one of the most precious resources we have. Money is something you trade your life energy for. You sell your time for money. It doesn't matter that Ned over there sells his time for $100 and you sell yours for $20 an hour. Ned's money is irrelevant to you. The only real asset you have is your time. The hours of your life. When we're starting out in our careers, we're all trading our time for money. We don't have much of a choice. We don't have much money. Thus, we trade the only other resource we have, our time, to earn money. But time is a diminishing asset. We can't create any more time even if we wanted to. We can't take the DeLorean back in time to redo parts of our lives despite how much we might want to. Once we spend yesterday's 24 hours, we'll never get it back. But we often forget this fact. We take this precious resource for granted. Thinking I have plenty of time, I can do that tomorrow, it can wait. If you have to go to work today because you have to bring a paycheck tomorrow, that is reality. When you don't have much in the way of financial resources, you have to trade time for money. The key is, how are you using the financial resources that you've traded your time for? Spending it all away on toys? Remember, you traded your most precious resource to get that money. Look around your accumulated stuff and ask, how many hours of my life did I invest to have this? Chair, car, match set of cookware, diploma on the wall? And see what this does to your next purchase. My number three favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Don't make work more important than it is. Our paid employment has taken on my rules. Our jobs now serve the function that traditionally belong to religion. They're the place where we seek answers to the perennial question. Who am I? And why am I here? And what's it all for? And I am very guilty of this. I've been known to be a workaholic and I still struggle with this every day. Work plays a crucial role in our society. A good chunk of the population is always in some form of formal occupation. And because of that fact, our economy is able to function and we're all able to buy the things that we need. However, too often, we make our jobs way more important than it is. We not only find our identity and self-worth from our occupation, we expect our jobs to fill our deepest needs. Exhilaration, longing, and sometimes even romance. Yes, work should provide us with growth. Growth as human beings. And for me, it's helped me to shape a lot of my skills. Better communication, ability to focus, and the knowledge to navigate relationships. However, it shouldn't be the center of our lives. Bronnie Ware, the author of The Top 5 Regrets of the Dying, talks about in her book how one of the major regrets many elderly had in their deathbed was this. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number 4 favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Our job title doesn't define our worth as human beings. One of the major reasons we place our jobs on the pedestal is because many of us define our sense of self-worth from the way we make our living the prestige of our job, and oftentimes the paycheck that comes from that job. Remember the last time we had an encounter with someone new? Don't we all secretly assess the success of the people we meet? We don't ask them if they're living life aligned with their values. Rather, we ask where they work, what their position is, where they live, and what they drive. Yes, it's really hard to avoid this line of questioning because we're all conditioned to it. And I'm one of the biggest culprit of that. It's hard to get around the question of what someone does for a living because that's how we've been conditioned as a society. To label ourselves and each other. I am Tay, the YouTuber. She is Maria the teacher. He is Joe the plumber. And there is nothing inherently wrong with understanding what someone does for a living because work plays a major role in all our lives. The issue is when we use them to size someone up, when we see it as a symbol of success. One of the most interesting phenomena we see at work related to this is when it comes to giving job titles. Most often hyperinflated job titles because we want an increased status. Customer experience enhancement consultant? 
aka I work in sales. Senior Media Publication Administrator, aka I deliver newspaper. Protein Distribution Engineer, aka I cut meat. Or my favorite, Creative Online Financial Media Entertainer, aka I made YouTube videos from my living room. Work is great. It helps us make a living and enables us to grow as individuals. But let's not let the job titles get to our head. It doesn't define us as individuals. Number five favorite takeaway from your money or your life. So how do we combat the tendency to make our work the center of our lives? To stop measuring our self-worth based on our job title? By building a life outside of work. During the last half century, we begin to lose the fabric of family, culture, and community that give meaning to life outside of the workplace. Many people gravitate towards giving work more value and our job titles more importance because we struggle to find meaning to life outside of the workplace. I've known many people who work simply because they're bored. Not sure what to do on the weekend? Maybe I should spend a few hours cleaning up my inbox. Hard to engage with the kids during vacation? Let me finish up this PowerPoint presentation for the next board meeting. Again, it's not to say work is not important and doesn't have a place in our lives. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do our best in the workplace. The issue is when we don't build anything outside the workplace to give us meaning and purpose, which is oftentimes more important in the long run. For me, getting married and having kids have really woken me up to the importance of having a life outside of work. As I alluded to earlier, I struggled with workaholism. Maybe it had to do with needing to find my place in the world, or to prove to everyone that I was a successful adult. Whatever the reason, I never gave myself much thought to life outside of work. But it is crucial. And some studies have actually shown that when you have a balanced life, you're actually more effective at work. So if you struggle to find life outside of work, try today. Go coach your son's soccer team. Read books not related to work. Take on an activity just for the sake of the activity, not for a specific monetary and status purpose. My number six favorite takeaway from your money or your life. More is not better. A lot of times, more is actually worse. I feel like this need for more is built into our DNA. I often take my kids to Costco, and one of the best parts of Costco is their free samples. Just by making your way around the whole warehouse, you not only experience breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but an ice cream dessert on top of that. And my kids can't help themselves but go back for more. And even when they don't enjoy a certain flavor of yogurt, they keep asking if they can get seconds. And I have to ask, aren't you full? What do you want more? And most often, they don't even know why. They just want more, especially when it's free. More, 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 more. This idea that more is better is best represented by our consumerism lifestyle. For Americans, and increasingly for consumers in other nations, this more is better model leads us to trade our cars every three years, buy new clothes for every event and every season, get a bigger and better house every time we can afford it, and upgrade everything from our TV to our smartphone simply because a new version has been released. To me, actually, less is much better. Not only is less less costly, but when we have less things, we're saving our energy and time that most often goes towards more things. When you have a big home, it looks nice from the curbside. But how many rooms and bathrooms do you have to maintain and clean? And what about the furniture you have to fill it with? When you have tons of clothes, you need a big closet to store them. When you have several cars, you need more car spaces or garage spaces to fill them. For me personally, more is not better. Most often, less is better. My number seven favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Frugality means enjoying what we have. Frugality doesn't just mean spending less money or buying cheaper items. It's actually reflected by how well you enjoy the items that you own. If you have 10 dresses but still feel like you have nothing to wear, you may be a compulsive shopper. The thrill of getting is greater than the joy of having and using it. But if you have 10 dresses and have enjoyed wearing all of them for years, you are frugal. When people hear the word frugal, we immediately associate it with images like worn out clothes, beater cars, and deprivation. However, according to the authors, being frugal has more to do not by one's penny pinching habits, but rather by the degree of how much you enjoy the items you buy or own. I do this often with the books I own. Though most times I don't debate too much about buying new books if the topic interests me, I also see myself just collecting new books because I like the thrill of buying something. And when I catch myself doing this, I try to make an effort to review the books I already own before getting a new one. And most often, I find that there are tons of books that I can read and enjoy right away without the need to buy a new one. In the same way, if we can learn to take inventory of what we already own and extract pleasure from them today, we're naturally living a frugal life. To be frugal means to have a high joy to stuff ratio. My number eight favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Recognize the secret to life satisfaction. Enough. The authors introduce this graph in the book, the fulfillment curve. The fulfillment curve shows the relationship between the experience of fulfillment and the amount of money we spend, usually represented by the items we acquire. Usually when we first start out, more possessions did indeed mean more fulfillment. A warm home, hot food, and clothes on our back ensured our survival. Thus, we were more fulfilled, more money we spent. And as we moved through life, we were able to buy more comforts. A slightly bigger shelter, a car to take us from point A to B, 
a meal out once in a while, more satisfaction. Then we moved into luxury items, nice vacations, a home on a huge lot, a brunch out every Saturday morning. But what is most interesting is that our satisfaction curve started to level out. Because what all these luxury items were doing was requiring more time at work, more time away from the family, more taxes, and just overall more demand. At a certain point, more money didn't just result in more fulfillment. It actually started to work against us. The more stuff we bought to try to increase our life fulfillment, the curve actually headed downward. Thus, the part of secret to life, it would seem, comes from identifying for yourself that point of maximum fulfillment. And what is that point of maximum fulfillment called? The word is enough. At the peak of the fulfillment curve, we have enough. Essentially, you have enough for your survival, enough for your comfort, and even some for your special luxuries. But no more to burden you unnecessarily. Once you have discovered your personal point of maximum fulfillment, your fulfillment curve can reverse direction and head straight up. My number 9 favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Debt is a dream destroyer. We're conditioned to accept debt as a natural part of adult life. It's part of living, so accept the consequences and move on. But the consequence of debt is detrimental. It's not just credit card debt we owe some credit card company. It's not only a car payment we owe the car financing bank. It can be a dream destroyer. Debt for many has been the great dream destroyer. Acquired to fund a dream of an education, or a home, or a wedding, and then standing by the door of every future dream, arms crossed saying, pay up or you can't go further. We all have dreams growing up, and our dreams change with time. For some, it could be being a professional soccer player. For others, it could be writing that novel, or even something practical like starting your own business. But if we have debt, it will stand in the way of our dream, as a huge wall, as a pile of rock boulders, or a raging river that is impossible to cross. The debt requires service, and we'll need to remain in our current jobs and our current positions in order to service that debt. Our priority isn't our dream, rather it is the credit card company or the bank that loaned that money to us. When my wife and I were trying to pay off our $105,000 student debt right after our marriage, we had to place everything in pause in order to service our debt. We couldn't pursue new career opportunities. We couldn't think about moving to a new place. And we even delayed having kids because of it. If you have sacrificed your dream on the altar of the almighty dollar, you need to reclaim them as they are the fuel for this journey. My number 10 favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Track every cent. Keep track of every cent that comes into or goes out of your life. This one is a hard one if you've never done this in your life. I sure did not do this until well into my 30s. I thought I had a good sense of how much money I made and how much money I spent. I didn't give much care to understand why there wasn't much left in the bank account at the end of each month. Maybe some rounding error. However, if we want to make progress in our finances, much of it starts with knowing where our money is going. Through writing down every cent that comes into and goes out of your life, you're awakening this latent superpower and inviting increasingly to direct your life. Thankfully, we're living in 21st century, so we have tools that can help us do this with ease. One of my favorite online tools to track our spending is Mint. One annoying aspect of Mint is its ads. They are making the tool available for free to consumers, so they have to find a way to fund themselves. So it makes sense. If you connect all your accounts to Mint, it will aggregate all your spending in one place for you. I find myself using the trend function often so I can understand what category where I'm spending most money on. In addition to being able to understand your spending trend, when you track your expenses, it will naturally have the effect of controlling your expenses. Keeping track does wonders for quelling the urge to splurge. My number 11 favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Track your net worth. In the line of tracking our expenses, the authors emphasize the importance of tracking our net worth. Essentially, all your assets such as investments minus your liabilities, such as debt. Tracking your net worth gives you a broader picture of your finances. For the years you have been working for wages, a certain amount of money, which you just calculated, has entered your life. The amount that is left in your life now is your net worth. If you don't know your overall net worth, you really don't know where you stand as regards to your finances. I've known people who thought they were doing well and realized after calculating their net worth, they were actually doing horribly. Fast student loans, big mortgages, and numerous car loans actually show that they were in the negative. Not in the positive they thought all their stuff reflected. But I also know many people who thought they weren't doing that well with their finances, realized after calculating their net worth, they were much further ahead than they thought. They didn't have much in the way of debt, and because they had been diligently investing for the past several decades, their net worth was actually in multiple digits. In which the lesson was, they were actually enduring unnecessary stress fretting over the $5 latte. They had more than enough to buy that latte and more. But of course, this wasn't clear until they started tracking their net worth. For my wife and I, tracking our net worth has been most valuable when we reviewed across the years. When we were knee deep in our debt paydown journey over a decade ago, our net worth showed that we were actually in the negative. However, over the years, as we paid off our debt and got better with saving and investing, it was exhilarating seeing this number incrementally climb up, which kept us motivated to keep on with our financial journey, looking for ways to save and invest more money. My number 12 favorite takeaway from your money or your life. Ask hard questions. This really is the main takeaway from this book. It challenges you to ask hard questions. It's right in the title of the book. Your money or your life? Are you trading your life for money? If so, what can you do to change it? And once you've done well with money, then what? If you didn't have to work for a living, what would you do with your time? What have you done with your life that you're really proud of? 
How would you spend the next year if you knew it was the last year of your life? These are hard questions that don't have a simple yes or no answer to them. You have to wrestle with them to identify your own personal answer. And you also have to recognize that the answer will be different at the different phases of your life. Thank you guys for watching. And in the line of hard questions, if you'd like to read some of my other favorite books that ask hard questions, please check out my video here. Until next time, all the best. Thank you.